the Spot Track Podcast, talking sports contracts, the salary cap, and business of sports. Welcome to another edition of the Spot Track Podcast. My name is Mike Gennetti. It is Monday, July 31st. We are on the cusp of Major League Baseball's trade deadline. Cousin Dan joins. We'll talk a little bit about that at the back end of this thing, but we start with the running back conversation. It is not going away. In fact, it's getting worse, thanks to the Colts and Jonathan Taylor and his agent and Jim Mersey. Uh, we dive in from a bunch of angles on this. A, the comments that were made. What does it mean? B, Jonathan Taylor's value, because I do think that he is an important figure in this whole conversation. The fantasy side of this, again, something not being talked about, but I don't think it's irrelevant. And where do we go from here? The Barkley, the Jacobs, the pending free agents, another gigantic pool of running backs becoming available in 2024. And uh, maybe some ways to kind of tinker with this thing just a little bit. So big running back NFL conversation. And then a little bit of an MLB trade recap as we get ready for this deadline in just about 24 hours. That's next. Dan Simmons here. And uh, Dan piqued my interest this morning, early on a Monday, kind of unusually, right? With a hot take, with um, a what-if scenario. And it involves the running back, something we talked about quite a bit. It's not really the topic I was planning on discussing today, Dan, except Jonathan Taylor and his agent and Jim Ursay and the Colts kind of not only rehashed the whole situation, but I think brought it to a whole new level, which I think got you involved, got you discussing uh, how this might play out, not only specifically with that scenario, but going forward. I, I mean, it's, it's not an irrelevant conversation for us to have to talk about where this is headed because it's it's a direct comparison to how the rest of the league is going to work. In my opinion, I think your discussion, which we'll get to is going to involve separating the quarterback money or separating the quarterback conversation completely. I think it's the right conversation to be having because that is what's going to happen with the rest of the league right now. It's running backs. It's going to be interior defensive linemen. It's going to be interior linebackers. Safety have already seen this happen. Tight ends have already seen this happen. This is just going to be step one and, and I think a 10 part puzzle, right? That's going to continue to over, you know, to kind of, to kind of grow momentum with the remaining seven years of the CBA. I know, oh, by the way, that's my favorite part of this, right? Every time something becomes public and somebody like me or, or, or somebody else in the industry sort, so, sort of brings the CBA into it, we really find out just how bad this CBA is for the players. It's bad. We knew it was bad. It's better than the last one but it's still extremely owner dominant. Where are you right now? Are, do you want to talk Jonathan Taylor specifically? Do you want to get into the running back conversation? Do you want to talk about where things are headed in this league in terms of the quarterback money? I'm going to lay this out for you and just sit back and listen. I mean, I guess I don't know the best starting point to deal with this, but I, I mean, the, the essence of our discussion that came up was, was basically where does this go from here from the standpoint of this is becoming a more frequent talking point? I mean, we have like at least three pretty, um, you know, spotlight examples of that this year with Barkley, Jonathan Taylor, um, Josh Jacobs as well. And and this is not going to go away. We've seen this in past seasons um, and going forward. It sounds, I, I mean, even the Austin Eckler situation where he wanted you know, <clears throat> additional money. And there was really just no leverage on his side. These superstar players who are the face of the league um, in a lot of ways. I mean, I understand we, we all, a lot of people think running back is replaceable, but it's also one of the prominent offensive positions, which creates a lot of um, intangible value on there. Like, like these are the most notable faces in the league um, for people who are casual fans fantasy players, anything like that. So <clears throat> can I, I can I jump asked, in real quick and, and yeah, just yeah. ask this question? Cause I think it might give us a little momentum. You, you're big into the fantasy world still. Uh, you've kind of shifted gears to the gambling side of it a little bit more, but the, even, even with that, that DFS approach, is there a fantasy devaluation happening for running backs at all, Dan? Because it's, it's not an irrelevant com comparison to make, right? It's production. Fantasy production is is NFL production to some degree. Now it's it's, it's somewhat jaded and arcade, but it, has there ha, has there been a shift to taking quarterbacks earlier, taking wide receivers earlier, as there has been essentially from a financial standpoint um, in the fantasy world? 
Definitely in a lot of ways. I mean, there still are your um, premier Christian McCaffrey guys like that, that will still go at the top of drafts, but it, it, it it's very much wide receiver um, dominated at this point and quarterbacks. Um, whereas like you used to be able to get Patrick Mahomes in a late round, um, the elite guys who have a lot of the, uh, who are sort of chipping away at the running back rushing mm-hmm. um, yardage and totals, et cetera. Those are the kind of quarterbacks who are going um, earlier than we've ever seen the Lamar Jackson types that offer you a super high floor and a really high ceiling. Um, whereas previously you wanted kind of like an anchor running back um, yeah. to just build your team around. But I mean, if you spend in early, like from a fantasy conversation, if you spend an early round pick on one of those guys, he gets hurt. That was the strength of your team. And the re- in theory, the rest of your positions are a little bit weaker because you focused on such a high variance running back position. Um, so we're kind of seeing that translate in, in that real life NFL as well, yeah. where these teams um, just, see the value in quantity over like specifically like elite quantity uh, qu- uh you, yeah, you know yeah, what i mean right. quality over quantity kind of thing um so one more question like just specifically I, I remember back in the days maybe even three four years ago if you had a flex position in your on your fantasy roster you're almost always using a running back there because of the extra 50 or 60 points per year that that person could generate is that now a wide receiver role or is that, you know, a top tight end role? Are you double tight ending, tight ending with a flex position now? Or is it still, for the most part, uh, a number two or three running back on your roster? T- typically, like format dependent, obviously. I, I think yeah, mo- yeah. the majority of people are sticking a, a wide receiver there. Yeah. Um, but it does depend on how you build your team. Typically in the late rounds, I think it's easier to find like speaking to our earlier points. If a guy like, let's just play out um, like the Browns, Nick Chubb, Mm -hmm. early round running back. Most people, a lot of, he's a pretty big favorite to lead. Sorry, not a favorite. He's a pretty big name to lead the league in rushing from like a betting perspective. Um, I like that offense a lot. Something goes wrong there. He gets hurt. Who's next up? Jerome Felton, a late round guy name a lot of people don't know he has some pass catching ability so it's easier to find replaceable players in the late rounds at the running back position rather than the wide receiver position those guys like I know we think there's a million wide receivers but targets are very much yeah. earned in this league and if you are not a target earner some somebody who can command a large share of targets it's going to be very like unless you're in like a best ball scenario which takes your hot you know your high score you don't have to start a specific lineup um unless you're in that kind of league it's very hard to sort Mm -hmm. of um peg when these like um you know guys who can pop off for three you know Mm -hmm. three catches for 90 yards and two touchdowns like a gabe davis type it's harder to hit those guys um so from like a like a reliability standpoint i i personally invest in the wide receiver position more and am willing to kind of like throw darts in the late rounds with wide receivers, which makes a lot of people uncomfortable. I try and I, I don't want to say a coach. I, I realize though uh, that you're basically just narrating the GM conversation right now. I mean, that's exactly, exactly what is being said behind closed doors right now. Exactly. Which is what well, I'm glad you kind of took it to this comparison because there are a lot of parallels. I mean, like I, I know people like the fantasy industry gets a bad rap for a bunch of nerds in their basement, but they these are very a lot of these people analyzing these scenarios are very like even if they didn't play um you know stick their hand in the dirt when they were younger these are smart people analyzing the game from like a you know probability. a very high, it's a game yeah. of probability yeah exactly in a very high level perspective too where um i mean i listen to, i listen to just straight up x's and o's football podcasts as well that um you know, to try and learn some things from a different perspective, but there is so much, I'm constantly reminded of how much crossover there is between those two fields, just athletic reporters who are at training camp reporting on things and how they're breaking situations down um, versus how Mm -hmm. fantasy analysts are doing the same thing. So um, uh, this is to the point that like what's happening in the fantasy community is 
exactly what's happening in real life NFL organizations in a different way. I don't mean to make it a one for one comparison here, but no, me neither. Um, but I do think it's a relevant conversation, especially this time of year, right? As everybody's sort of thinking fantasy draft and the Colts are now having to think about what the hell they do with their RB one, because it's ugly. And we'll get there in a second. I have a last kind of crossover question for you. Let's just say, and I looked at a couple of quick rankings here before I got on, let's say you're the number eight pick in your draft. Okay. Jonathan Taylor and Tyreek Hill are kind of living in that world right now. Who are you taking, Dan, with your first pick? Um, again, very league dependent. I'm yep. going to just yep. le- lean wide receiver typically there. I mean, the Tyreek Hill is maybe not the best example because there is a lot. I mean, both players have some, um, you know, potential for yep. like issues, what if, right? I mean, legal what if it's issues. Cooper Cup? What if it's Cooper Cup? Yeah, I'm going to lean on wide receiver there, yeah. Yeah, there's very few running backs that I feel I need to build a team around unless – Is I, it I McCaffrey think and should... Chubb? Is that it? Um, I mean, let's – because I want to I translate this into money, and, and, I, and I can, I think. Is Henry off your board right now as a top pick? Is Eckler off your board as a top pick? Well, so I, that's where it's it, – I do live in a little bit of a bubble of listening to specific people who are in like more high stakes type stuff. The content I listen to is a little bit more um, geared towards that kind of, uh, uh, you know, team, team building, if you will. Whereas like when I go to home leagues or my friend, like I, I, I have to constantly bring myself back to like, what is the talking point? Because certain p- players I might like and are gaining steam in like circles that I pay attention to, um, you know, my friends or whoever is in my league that is just sitting on their couch on Sundays and has like a bad rap because, you know, um, like Michael Gallup, for instance, has never produced for them, but maybe he's in a really good spot this year to pop off. So um, like Derrick Henry, if he falls a little bit in drafts, I think that there is so much negative rhetoric around the Titans and Derrick Henry that we've talked about this in the past. I'm a pendulum guy where last year everybody – Um, despite some injury concerns coming into the year, coming off of like a a major injury, the prior season, people wanted to just throw that out the window and be like, okay, he's just going to be the Derrick Henry monster. He always is. Well, now the pendulum is swung back where there's some negative connotation around that offense as a whole, the quarterback situation, um, you know, Mm -hmm. everything where if Derrick Henry falls in drafts, I'm willing to, to, (laughs) kind of go against them. And when I say fall, I'm saying into the second, maybe the third round turn yeah. somewhere in that range where if, ever, but, but I'm saying in general, in general drafts, friends of mine, family, like home leagues, you're going to be in people know Derek Henry. He's done well for them in the past. They're pro- he's probably not the guy who's going to fall, but I'm just trying to like go through. No, um, That's the right conversation. Um, not an accident. Why you said Gabe Davis out loud already too, by the way, pendulum guy for sure. Exactly. I think exactly. Gabe Davis was the sweetheart in a lot of the fantasy community last year. Everyone thought bona fide number two receiver in a hot offense. Josh Allen led quarterback quarterback offense. Um, And then this year, everybody just thinks he's out when the volatility that he's always had is still there. And he's in a very similar situation. So things like that is just I'm willing to say if everybody thinks this guy is dust, maybe he is dust, but I'm going to buy him at cost and try and capitalize like closing line value is like so huge in in fantasy that um you should be focused on that in a in a lot of ways not only focused on that but okay so back to it you you don't believe then i think is what i'm reading that jonathan taylor is a build your roster around guy do we now believe that the colts think that too i mean jim mercy has been pretty goddamn public right i would just to backtrack and clarify my previous point, he is one of like two years ago, he proved he's a workhorse back. He can be relied on. He showed a ton of dynamic ability in the past game, which was not really something coming out of college for him last year. I had an issue with people saying CMC or Jonathan Taylor. I thought it was Christian McCaffrey, a slam dunk 10 out of 10 times every time. Um, Now I, I still in a vacuum think JT is worth an early round pick in certain situations. Um, This one, I'm a little bit unsure. Like this is kind of where we got with like 
earlier, like our initial conversation is like, what happens here? Because yeah. if, if, he isn't going to get traded. I don't think he's going to get traded. It sounds like you don't think he's going to get traded. We can cover that a little bit more later. But if he's not going to get traded, he's going to be leaned on there unless he just – they, like, skirt around it, get out of that contract, or he, like, just holds out, doesn't want to play, whatever. But otherwise – He's vital. Ton of, he's absolutely vital. Exactly. Crucial in that offense. So he's going to get fed the ball in like the majority of circumstances, I, I would assume. So if the public perception is this guy's on his way out of town, they hate him. They don't want to like, they, they don't want to give him the ball. I'm going to, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to buy the dip. I'm just, it's just me, but I'm not like, it depends though. Who's on the board, my comfort level. If like, I want, you know, if somebody else falls that I'm more comfortable with, I'm still going to go that route. But in a vacuum, JT is one of those players. I think you theoretically could build around, but there is a lot of uncertainty around that situation. But as a fantasy player, that's where you capitalize the biggest is okay. when you look at All uncertainty right. and you and you cash in. Let's <laughs> let's merge these conversations because I, I I do like where this is headed. Um, I've said this before. I'm going to say it again. I think it's well. Well, let me ask you this first before I go on my soapbox. Just reading the room right now. Reading. Do I have to say X? Oh, I I guess X. Reading X. Um, the X sphere. Is the public on JT's side or Jim Ursay's side right now? Well, it's it's a great question. I think we are starting to transition to where people had for the last few years, people it took people a while to gravitate towards this mentality that Running back is sexy, but it's highly replaceable in a lot of ways, right? So the mainstream mentality is starting to gravitate towards that. And but but this is the first offseason where it's explicitly being stated almost that like we from an NFL owners organization standpoint, that they're just saying we don't have to pay them and yeah. figure it out. Like, right? Like they have no leverage. We're using our leverage. Nothing's going to change. My, Miles Sanders, thirteen million guaranteed. Saquon Barkley's nine hundred nine thousand of incentives, and now Jim Mercer's tweets. That's it. That's the run up here, and it's real, right? R it's right. out there. So I think my point is that since this transit, like people are warming up to this this concept, but it's not like a heart in a heartless way where they're just like from a. Human if you had, if you had to really... percentage it, where, where do you think we are? Because I, I I think you're right. I, I I might even, and I'm just going off my mentions and comments here and a bunch of JT tweets I've put out there. Everything you just said is what I'm reading. I, I love right. these guys, but it's just not the right move. We just I, I don't want my team paying the running back. Right. Under That's the what current... most fans are saying. <laughs> and it's not personal. These, you know, you know, people have no. the, his jersey, want him to stay. But yeah. if we're, t and, the, and this is the, the, again, for the millionth time, we struggle with this on a day to day basis from talking about what is a good business, organizational building, developmental, like mo yeah. what is good in that realm and what is good for the player. We are always encouraging players to make the most they can in their limited time at the top of their game. But, if we're talking about building a team in the right way to allocate resources, you have to agree that it's, he's a talented guy. We love you. I love the player, but we, you know, I, we can't, we, we, we have seen the ripple effect of what has happened from the yep. Z contract. Right. So that yep. we, you, I know you specifically thought that that was maybe the last time that ever happens. And it's kind of playing out right now. So in the current, all I'm saying is in the current context of the league, I think everybody does understand that. But the, 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 you know, the thesis of our original point, I think is like, where does this go? Because eventually I think that public perception is going to change where we don't, we don't just want this to be a talking point every off season where our favorite, favorite running backs and players in the league are unhappy because they're running into massive human beings 40, you know, 30 times a game and not really being compensated appropriately. When we look around and see, you know, salary, 20% of a team salary cap chewed up by a quarterback and or wide receiver one contract, which, yeah. um, so like, how do you, how does this 
shift in how do we move forward? I mean, maybe I'm just wrong. Maybe for forever, this will just be a talking point. Nothing will change. And but but I feel like this has to be addressed on some basic level in the next CBA. Is that is that out of line or? We'll get there. I want to stay on okay. JT. Got it. Um, and here's why. 2021 was a real deal. Uh, you you said it. He did everything that was asked of him coming out of college, and he added a passing game. He added it. In an 18-month span, developing in the NFL, he he made himself into a pass-catching running back. He did not do that one iota in college. It wasn't asked of him, and he knew what he had to do. His agent, his coaching staff, himself personally, looked around, read the room, and said, look, I got to start catching balls or I'm never going to make a dollar in this league. And he's right, right? And that's just how this is working right now. He did it in 2021. He was the best overall running back ahead of McCaffrey that year. No question about it. Then there was the ankle injury last year. And by the way, he was kind of a stinker before that. Um, last year was a big step back. So he's got red flags on his resume, which probably means he's not going to get McCaffrey money because any kind of tick on the, on the resume is going to knock you off the podium. And that's just how it works right now. And that's what Ursay basically said out loud. What Ursay said, though, about him being, I mean, I'm not going to say that, you know, if I'm dead and he's gone tomorrow thing, what he said, what he said is he's replaceable. Okay. That's the translation that we all have to take away from this. He's replaceable, but I believe that he can have a year that makes him not replaceable. I believe that he can do that. Now what it's going to lead to an 11 and a half million dollar franchise tag. Do we both agree with that? Unless things go really off the rails. I mean, at least the Colts will, are set up to do that. Yes. They're going to tag him. They're going to yeah. tag him and try to trade him at that point in time. Do you think there's any world where there's an offer before that? I I wanted to play this out mentally. I I struggle because how many teams are set up to then give him that contract, right? If the, the Colts, Colts have The Colts are. Right. This okay. is where I'm going, Dan. They are. Now, look, there's a Michael Pittman situation. If he has a year, they, they're they going to have to pay him what, whatever. That's not going to be $30 million a year, right? Michael Pittman's been 75% of what he should be, but he, he could be a guy still, and he's on, he's on an expiring contract. Other than that, they're going to have to draft and buy some more wide receivers at some point in time. They've got a quarterback who's going to be making three and a half to $4 million, you know, cash and cap per year after this bonus is paid off. That's it. I mean, and he's dynamic, and he could be a guy, but he could not be a guy, too. In other words, this is the Derrick Henry situation all over again. This is the Nick Chubb with Baker Mayfield's rookie contract situation all over again. It's here, right? It's We're here with that. And it's here for five years. You know, They've got four plus years of Anthony Richardson being dirt cheap unless he earns himself a three-year extension you, you know, when he's eligible. I, this is the, run, the one team right now that is able to do this. And he had the year two years ago. That probably warranted the contract. It's not going to be $16 million a year, okay? If anything, it's going to be a cap-adjusted version of Derrick Henry's contract, which is $29 million guaranteed at most. And I'm telling you right now, even that is too much. And this, this is the point I want to get to, and I said it in my last episode, and I want, I want to bring you into this conversation. If there's an offer December 1st from the Colts to Jonathan Taylor, that involves 23 million guaranteed. Okay. I'm not even, gonna, I don't even care what the per, per year is. I don't even care how long the contract is. There's 23 million guaranteed. Okay. And I'm telling you, he's making four, 4.3 million this year, and there's an $11.5 million tag coming next year. Okay. So I'm taking tag one, I'm taking tag two, and I'm giving him that exact number in terms of guarantees, by the way, which is what Barkley was offered this year, which is what Josh Jacobs was offered this year. Would be third. Would be currently third. I just I'm looking at it right now. Would be third Gu- guarantees at signing yeah. McCaffrey, Henry, and him. Right, Henry, Henry got twenty five point five. Right. 5, right? I, I, I've done so much on this. I I memorized this crap at this point. And Kamara just missed it, but that, just missed. That's, that's the tier of player we're talking. And Kam- about. Kamara's contract's going to fall off next year. Mixon's contract's going to fall off next year. Right. We're we're going to be in a really weird. Henry's contract's going to fall off next year. The the eight. Running backs who have 12 million plus per year, we're going to be down to about four. <laughs> okay. And one of them is going to be a rookie in Bijan. It's going to be bad. So, where do we go from here? Do you believe that Jonathan Taylor just has to take that 23 million guaranteed? 
from the Colts with everything I just said? I, I don't, I don't, I'm going to pawn. I really don't know. I do feel, I, I, I think you're going to lead me here. I do feel at a certain point, these guys have to take yeah. what's on. Like if this, if that's 80% of what he thinks his ceiling is, then at some point you just take that. If he, if there's a long game here where his um, representation is looking at exactly what you laid out and thinks that he should now be paid as like the top, you know, have all the the number one. But again, um, but again, is there a team better set up than the Colts to pay? The Colts, no, no. But my, but but if so, why are they publicly like? I I understand the public perception of wanting to get out in front of this, but I feel like the way they're going about this is souring awesome. that so much awesome. that. I, that that isn't both sides, that, like, by the way, his agents out there doing it. Or his, uh, everybody's right. making this worse. Yes, and that's why it's uh, that's why I have trouble saying that he would accept it because this is like going so far off the rails. But if this was just like a, hey, mm-hmm. we want to talk about the next contract. Here's your contract offer. Uh, I'd really like more, but let me sit on it. Maybe I'll take this before you know before week one. That's a different conversation. The pub, the pub, the public you know, negotiations of this mm-hmm. is, is pretty gross. So I, I'm not sure where it goes, but it doesn't, I, I don't know. You're right though. You are right. He, th- there are quarterback on a rookie deal. You have mm-hmm. limited other long-term commitments. Um, I, I don't, I, I, it's a reasonable point that they should be the ones to pay him, but. Pending running back free agents in 2024. Are you ready for the list? God. Derrick Henry, Josh Jacobs, Tony Pollard, Saquon Barkley, Austin Eckler, Cordero Patterson, Devin Singletary, CEH, DeAndre Swift, Jonathan Taylor, Damian Harris, Cam Akers, J.K. Dobbins, A.J. Dillon. I can keep going. Right. So he should the, – the point is he should he should take the money. <laughs> and that's I mean, what we're talking think, about. Is I, think, he, I think the point is he might never get offered this money. Right. Ever. I think – I, I'm really concerned that Barkley and Jacobs not taking their deals this year really messed everything up, really messed everything up. And again, I, I know they're worth more. I know that they're both worth 14 million a year, 30 million guaranteed. I, I know they are. Okay. And there's numbers that back it up based on previous contracts, but that's not what's work. What's happening right now. Okay. It's not, it's not what's happening. Everybody's projecting out the cash flow that has to go to a starting cornerback and quarterback and left tackle. And now right tackles make 22 million a year. And now centers make 15 million a year. And now guards make 20 million a year. It's not slowing down. And there's going to be a breaking point with a lot of these positions. And we're there with the running back. But if you're being offered 20 and change guaranteed with incentives that get you over that, and that's what's going to happen. I mean, these incentives aren't going away. You know what I mean? That's going to be the crux of it. If you earn it, you'll make it. So I, I, I just think we got to get ourselves there. And I'm dying for Jonathan Taylor to have a 2021 season that puts the onus back on the Colts because the Colts aren't going to be great, good without him. I don't care how good Anthony Richardson, you you're, bring your fantasy world back into it. Who are you drafting on that team, Dan? Who are you drafting in 2023 from a pr- productivity standpoint? Um, I mean, I like Michael Pittman. I think the talent's there. I think yeah. he has a chance to really rise, but it's hard to see that come into fruition this year with a rookie with a rookie running back. Um, like by low, I like I really like Jelani Woods as like a tight uh, dynasty tight end target. I think yeah. he could be a monster, but to your point, all of this is in coordination with a successful Anthony Richardson, which probably comes from a successful Jonathan Taylor season. So. Yeah, it all, it's all connected, but there's no one specifically I'm like itching, you know, to, to get at. Yeah. Can we quickly go through a, a bunch of other teams and just try to find a, another team that might pay a running back? I, I'm trying to steer positive here. I really am because I do think that there, I mean, the, obviously the public perception right now is at like an all-time low at this position. And again, we're all gonna, about to sit down in two weeks and draft you know, 50 of these players on our rosters in, in fantasy leagues and in DFS outputs. So it's, you know, we're going to care about them again soon in a positive way. So let's try to do this. 
are the Washington Commanders in a position to, to, to sign a running back? Could you see four for 50 for Josh Jacobs next year in Washington? I mean, I, I'm not super well versed on like the cap room and all of that. No, stuff. I mean, don't worry from, about a de- it. from a yeah, depth chart wise, for sure. They have room sure. there. Yeah. I mean, Brian Robinson is a pretty limited running. I mean, great story but relatively limited skills wise running back gibson's um, gonna fall off the roster they already I mean, lost mckissick he, right right he could he could have a great year but he's on an expiring deal uh gibson that is so yeah would so, jerry I, I jones it do it again Whew. because he's in position to he doesn't even have a backup for tony pollard right now who lost a leg last year Would Jerry Man. Jones do it again? I don't know. I, I mean, <laughs> Jerry Jones I want to say no, but... feels like a match made in heaven. Yeah. I, I don't think the Giants are going to get rid of him, but I, it feels like a match made in heaven. I, I think he might. I think he might do it. I'm, I'm, by the way, these are all maybes. I'm not saying they're going to or they should. Would the Arizona Cardinals do it to handcuff Kyler Murray's situation? James Conner's falling off next year. And potentially, uh, you know, if they yeah. want to go that route and draft Kyler, a rookie Kyler Murray might be falling off next year. <laughs> right, right, exactly. So, I mean, I would think so, that yes. would be more dependent on what happens, especially if Kyler were to. I could see them investing in one of these premier guys as um, the, you know, let's develop our quarterback with a legitimate running threat. But would the Green Bay Packers pay another running back? Yeah, you have uh, Aaron Jones likely to come off, and is Dylan? Dylan's coming inspiring? off, and Jordan yeah. Love has that kind of bridge contract. They've done it before. I won't. I won't rule it out. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my point is, I think there's some teams there. I think there's some teams there. Um, do you believe that the process is going to get better or worse? Last comment. Well, it's it's going to further deteriorate unless something changes. And I think that was like the, you know, the initial conversation is what changes and we really can't pinpoint it. And I listened to quite a bit on this and nobody smart that can, I think is I, smart can really. Can I jump in on this and take us in a, a bit of a tangent with the CBA stuff? Because, you know, I mean, the Florios of the world are trying like hell to bring all their legalese into this conversations. And, you know, this is what the players should be doing and going to the NFL PA. And say, I, can I give you a, a really not hot take about all this quarterback contracts aren't stopping running backs from getting money at all. 0%, 0.0%. Okay. The quarterback conversation is the excuse that's being used. Okay. Jim Mercer doesn't have a quarterback. He has to pay. Now he's paying Matt Ryan $12 million this year, but that's his fault. Okay. But he doesn't have a quarterback to pay. Most of these teams, the Houston Texans didn't sign a huge quarter running back this year. Okay, and they're paying nobody, nobody this offseason. But they signed Devin Singletary for a buck seventy-five. Okay. The teams that could afford a running back didn't pay a running back. And the teams that say they can't afford a running back are also not paying the running backs. This has nothing to do with how much their quarterback makes. This has nothing to do with what kind of cash is gonna, gonna have to be sent out, you know, in the next two years. This has nothing to do with the salary cap, which by the way, could be two fifty next year at 228 right now, right? I mean, gigantic jump coming next year for the most part. Has nothing to do with Patrick Mahomes and Jalen Hurts and Lamar Jackson. Nothing. And has nothing to do with the wide receiver boom. It simply has to do with the fact that those two positions are offering more production, which is why you're drafting them differently than you did five years ago. And every front office sees it that way too. And oh, by the way, College football has always utilized three running backs. Always, right? Always. And now we're just doing that here. You you don't need one. You need three. You need five. And you don't pay one. You pay three. You pay five. So it's, I don't think it has anything to do with the fact that quarterbacks make so much money. I don't. Do you? Or is it just an excuse? If Patrick Mahomes took a $25 million per year contract, do you think they'd sign Josh Jacobs to $15 million a year? 
No, no. I, th- no. I th- to answer <laughs> your question, I, I, Pacheco in the seventh round again. Yeah, I think ninety-five percent of it is the replaceability and the one hundred percent and stuff like that. Um, and it is a very convenient. Um, yep. Excuse to your point too, because there are other stigmas around some other positions, like middle linebackers, for instance. People say, "Why ever pay a middle linebacker?" Well, teams still are paying middle linebackers, right? So um, it's not it's not like yeah. the whole league has folk uh, has excluded any other position. If that makes sense, like the the running back is the one that we constantly keep coming back to, saying, are, "Is anyone ever going to get paid?" Like with this, you're the next guy up, get the next biggest contract. And by the way, let me jump in. When when Delvin Cook signs with the Jets, maybe in like an hour, what we have to stop doing is saying Delvin Cook is a Jet because Aaron Rodgers took a pay cut. No, that's yeah, not right. true. It has I'm nothing so, to do with it. It has I'm nothing so to do with it. Now, Delvin Cook might be a Jet because Aaron Rodgers is the quarterback there. That That might be true. But please do not bring Aaron Rodgers' contract into this conversation. They are completely... It's two separate things. By the way, he took the pay cut. I said I talked about it on the last episode. If you want to talk, listen to it in detail, he took a pay cut, and the cap numbers are phenomenal, and they definitely help make life easier. But it would not be impossible to sign Delvin Cook on any team right now, including the Chiefs, who have about eight hundred thousand in cap to work with. Everybody could sign Delvin Cook right now, immediately. I promise you. And by the way, that's, but that's hear- a real thing. No, that's a real thing. We have to, as a community, stop, stop. In, uh, um, igniting, enabling that conversation. Like, oh, everybody else has to flex so that the running backs can get money. No. GMs have to say, I'm, I want to pay a running back. That's all that has to happen. Jonathan Taylor is worth it for, for a two-year guarantee. Let's give him $25 million. That's what has to happen. That's it. That's it. <laughs> yeah, it's a good point. And if I have to hear one more uh, Aaron Rodgers oh. comparison to Tom Brady taking pay cuts every oh. year to, to enable the Patriots to... Like, we, we get it on the record. They in they theoretically take pay cuts for cap reasons and everything they're still getting paid the majority of that money in one 306 way million dollars he's made aaron Rodgers yeah, in this league it, exactly so yeah. and, and it, even in the how they restructure there's still a lot of times getting money on the back end it's just mm-hmm. not on on you know the record yeah. for for cap purposes or whatever cap, but if, cap I, have and cash. Hear, cap and if cash. I have to hear that laundered <laughs> one more time like this but i mean that's i know that's a hill you're gonna die on i'm sure yeah so. <laughs> yeah so look I, i'm i'm all for the how to fix the nfl conversation i love doing with baseball as you know we do that quite often this is this wasn't one of those this isn't one of those where okay now we we separate the quarterback conversation and make it its own thing or we we, we adjust the way that running backs are franchise tagged or whatever it's going to be, right? Whatever it's going to be. And now the money will start flowing in. No, uh, no, it isn't. It, it, you know, it's not going to happen unless you do something drastic, like, uh, like some kind of guarantee structure, which will never happen. You're never going to, you know, specifically single out the running back position in the NFL from a financial perspective. It's not going to happen. Uh, it's just about, and I'll say this again. I know this is boring. One guy just has to do it. One guy just has to be McCaffrey, completely irreplaceable. Christian McCaffrey is still irreplaceable. Do you agree with that? Um, in a lot of ways, yes. In a lot of ways, I think the team, uh, specifically with him, the team context is a little different. I have a lot of faith in that coach and him, his ability to maximize um, players' talents um, accordingly, but. So, so all I'm saying there is if they lost McCaffrey, I think they have a lot of other talent on that roster that they would make it around. But if you want to go back and say he's on the Panthers or a lot, basically any other team, maybe besides the 49ers, I feel very, very similar to that, that he offers so much um, three down back blocking abilities, leadership, et cetera. Yeah. I, I would tend to agree with that. I think the current land, the current situation is just a little bit unique, but absolutely. All right, one final thing, and then we'll move on to some baseball. I I put a tweet out, I don't know, during the Barkley-Jacobs mess, maybe two weeks ago now, um, with an idea about how to convert the franchise tag for running backs, wide receivers, and tight ends into an offensive weapon tag. So instead of having a price for each, it's one price that puts all three of those positions into one container 
And then we do calculations and the cap percentages and things like that. And we get a number and the number is going to be high, right? It's going to be close to, if not over 20 million at the end of the day, because of the wide receiver pay right now, that's the cost to, to franchise tag a tight end. Now that's the cost to franchise tag a running back. Now, I think more players would get to free agency for sure. I don't think you'd see a $20 million franchise tag for Tony Pollard, for instance, because of the injury situation. I think maybe Barkley and, Jacobs may still have one, may, maybe. It's a definitely a maybe. Um, but I think it would slow the the egregiousness of that process because it's a, literally double the number than they're dealing with right now. Is there a window into that? They they essentially do it for linebackers, right? Every linebacker is just a linebacker, whether you're rushing the passer or or you're in coverage. Um so there is kind of, and every offensive lineman is just an offensive lineman. There's not a guard number and a center number and a right tackle number. It's just OL. So that's a huge bucket. And that's a big variance in terms of pay right now. So there's precedence for this. Do you think this is something we can get to? I've actually never heard of this, but it seems like a logical way to kind of drag up the the running back values a little bit, right? I mean, yeah. wide receivers are still going to make their money. They're the ones kind of that they're the ones who would mostly be booing um, those numbers for running backs and tight ends. Right. I mean, like how many tight ends have been franchised tagged that a lot would be, would be worth 20 mil though. Do you know what I mean? I think, are we okay? That numbers, that? Because that number is about half. That so typically, so right? push back. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's right with the running back stuff. So, so push back then. Do you think, and this is a big concern I have as well. Do you think if the tag becomes not applicable because it's too expensive, that those guys will just never get paid? They'll go to the open market and they still won't get their money. <sighs> if, if, Barkley was able to hit free agency this year instead of the tag. And I'm trying to think of a tight end. I'm not even sure I have one right now. Evan Ingram, Evan Ingram. If Evan Ingram was able to hit the market right now without the tag, are they seeing the big guarantees that they, that they were looking for? Mm, <laughs> it really is hard to quantify. Cause I, I want to say if, I know the, if the franchise tag becomes almost irrelevant where you're never going to franchise tag a running back or a tight end. Cause that number is so high, then a big chunk of the leverage, like I feel like the owners have that leverage because you get to the end of your rookie contract and it's not even a clean cut and dry. You're a free agent. You're not a free agent. They have the ability you're, to you're tag in limbo. You, right? Yeah. You're yeah in you limbo. have purgatory for two, possibly two years if they want to, yeah. hang on to you and kind of crush your long-term value. So th that's the huge, that's like the biggest, one of the biggest leverage points, I think from an ownership perspective is they have that franchise tag where they can kind of just punt the decision and come back next year if they can, can fit you under the cap sort of thing. So um, I don't know. I, I, my, my mind is kind of wrestling with itself. I want to say that maybe the huge guaranteed contracts would not be there. Like the ceiling contracts wouldn't be there, but they would still be more likely to be able to lock up some decent guaranteed money quicker, but maybe that's flawed thinking. I, I don't know. What do you, I, I, do you have a, are you it, leaning one way on that? Well, I, yeah, I, I put the tweet out. So obviously I'm leaning towards this offensive weapon tag, which, which would essentially take, I don't know, 75% of these running back tags away and, and definitely tight ends as well. It would take him away. The, the old adage, and I've heard a bunch of agents tell me this, is, well, you know, anytime you're attached to a number, that's your number. You know, I get these tweets all the time when I post a market value for Joe Burrow. Joe Burrow's market value is whatever the Bengals pay him. It's not wrong, okay? It's not wrong, but we're still trying to project and predict and things like that, and that's part of the process. But the second that Barkley and Jacobs got the 11, you know, the 10 and change, the 10.1, that essentially became their baseline value. So to then hear that J the Giants offered Barkley 11 million a year and 23 million guaranteed, whatever that no November number was, they were sim uh, simply just precursing the franchise tag value conversation. You know what I mean? They're basically saying, "Look, we think the tag number is right. We weren't. We're going to give you two years for you know worth of it instead of just one right now." Again, I think he should have taken it. But 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 if the tag is 22 million, right? 
what happens when a, when a running back is franchise tagged? Okay, because are, are we going to then get the reset? Or are they going to have to come back down to earth, right? Is it literally just we're saying right. for one year, for age 26, you're worth this to us, but never again. I, I, I'm worried about that. I'm worried about that because I want these guys to get two, three years of security again. I think that's the biggest thing, even if it is meaning the contracts are declining overall value wise, but they're getting their guarantee. Do um, we? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, please. I was just going to say, do we see that with quarterbacks, though? Because we see quarterbacks who, in mm-hmm. theory, aren't probably worth the. I, I'm asking out of being naive on this. We, we, in theory, see quarterbacks get tagged sometimes that may be not worth that. Um, money in the short term, but that the team wants to kind of buy a, another year, like a wait and see year. Um, do those quarterbacks then say, well, that was my market. That was my market. I, I genuinely don't know the answer to that, I guess. Now that they, you talk, they don't them. because they traded off for two years of guarantees. So instead of giving me 36 million for one, I want, I want 40 million guaranteed over two. So they, they essentially become a 20 million per year player, right? I see this I in the NBA. The NBA has been doing this for a long time. Guys trade, guys trade big player options for new three-year contracts that actually carried less value annually, which helps the team, by the way, but guarantees them more dollars in their career, right? Longer term. That's what has to happen here for running backs, I think, and for tight ends, right? I, I don't know that Cole Komet was ever going to get $24 million guaranteed Can't believe that. in any other capacity. He had to take this contract, right? He had to. Justin Fields is on the rookie contract. It was the right setup for them to do that. That, That's what we're talking about here. Okay, if your team is in a situation where they can offer you a multi-year guarantee and you're not a position of power, you have to take the contract. You have to do it because there just aren't those kind of situations. I I, I looked right now for 15 minutes. I couldn't find more than four teams who I think might give a $12 per year contract to a running back in the next two years. It's just not going to happen. Okay, it's just logical. So... um, Again, I'm worried that Barkley and Jacobs' decisions this year kind of broke things even more, but I do think there's a world where Jonathan Taylor can produce himself back into this conversation, but based on what we've seen with this indie stuff, maybe not there, huh? <laughs> I, mean, that, I mean, that's pretty ugly. It's pretty uncharacteristically ugly. Yeah, I agree. I mean, not the first uh, Jim Ursay relationship to go off the rails here. So not necessarily surprising. Self, but Self-induced. <laughs> self-induced. All right. I can't let you leave without talking Max Scherzer. Um, there's a lot of trades to talk about. We're, we'll do that after the fact. We're about, I don't know, God, we're only about 30, year, 30 hours from the deadline here. Um, was it the right decision for the Mets? Do you know all the, all the nuts and bolts or do you want me to lay it out quickly? Well, go ahead and lay it out, but okay. It's Scherzer to Texas for a strong prospect, the top 100 prospect an infielder, uh, Ronald Acuna Jr.'s brother and essentially $35 million cash. So they paid off all the rest of Scherzer's salary for this year, which was about 14, five. And they paid off about 52% of next year's salary which was an option that got exercised as part of this trade. So they get themselves away from about 22 and a half million cash next year to the New York Mets. So that's the, that's the crux of this. Yeah. So when we spoke about this last week, I was on the side of, I thought it would be difficult for them to deal either Scherzer or, and or Verlander, both of them. Um, And it was mostly because of the contract situation. thinking that very few teams would want to a give up any sort of prospects to then have to take, sorry, to a, to just simply take on those contracts for um, the rest of this year. And like for Scherzer 2024 um, Mm -hmm. and, or give up prospects in, in, in the deal. Um, Good. I mean, flat out good on Steve Cohen for, committing the money that he did or else this would have just been a complete salary dump, no prospect in return. Now you do get a legit prospect who, by the way, I know you said back end of the top hundred prospects, he has been um, moving up a number of mid season prospect lists. He's more in that 50, that mid hundred range now. Mm. 
And people still think there's quite a bit of ceiling um, for him to develop. Obviously, we know who his brother is. Yeah, good genes. Yeah, it's not like uh, one for one um, comparison there, but you at least know some of what he could bring to the table if he hits his ceiling. So um, my main point, I mean, like good on both sides, the Rangers, they've already Mm. gotten this so far and they're not going to sit there and say, well, we've already spent this much. We can't keep committing. Um, They've already made two moves. Now Jordan Montgomery also headed there. Mm -hmm. Um, And speaking like to your running back, you know, giving up options for, you know, to future guarantees, whatever. Max Scherzer already picked up his option for next year as part of this um, right. to wait. He waived his no trade clause and um, on the condition that they, you know, they pick up the option, et cetera. So I think it was good for the Mets from a developmental perspective because Steve Cohen ponied up the money. Can't afford it. Uh, yeah. Can't can afford it. Right. Otherwise this would have been a straight salary dump. I think it would have left them, in limbo a lot for next year. Like how far do you go? Um, I mean, you don't, mm-hmm. you really don't need a full, re, a full tear down, but for them to create some financial flexibility um, for future years. Now, if Verlander also moves out the door and you're going to give um, more playing time to some of these younger players that, uh, you know, have been marinated, you know, the Fred Beatty's of the world, Mark Vientos, those guys who probably deserve more at bats. Um, it's, probably good overall for the state of that team considering where they are and how much money they spent moves they made in this past off season. It's kind of, they were just kind of in this purgatory where we, we talked about it and I was just like, I don't really know where they go to like stay competitive. And because I thought that they were going to have trouble getting rid of the Scherzer slash for the contracts, but they pulled me it too. off. So, so l- let me them. put it this way. Um, let's say they don't do this deal right now. And they, but they look to do it in the winter. Scherzer, you know, blows up at the front office again and says, "You got to get me out of here. This isn't what I signed up for." And by the way, fair, <laughs> totally fair. And he says, "I'm not opting out because it's forty three point three million, and I'm forty, so you got to get me out of here." Steve Cohen's still paying, right, twenty five million of that salary next year to get him out the door. But they're definitely not getting an Acuna type prospect this winter. Is that correct? Exactly. This yeah. And today, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we saw this when Scherzer went from Washington to the Dodgers. It was sort of a similar situation where the Nationals had to include Trey Turner to get premium prospects in Josiah Gray and Kyber Ruiz, et cetera, back in the deal, which people were like, how how did how did that package happen? Well, it was because Scherzer was basically just a, a money dump for the, the nationals that year. And um, I mean, they probably would have had multiple teams willing to kind of take the risk there. But mm-hmm. when the dot, I, I'm assuming the Dodgers got creative and said, well, well, if you want some prospect value in return, throw in Trey Turner, who has a year of term, et cetera. And it happened like that. So um, yeah, that's exactly how it works right now. Yeah. You can't just dump salary and think you're going to get away with it in this league. It's not going to work that way. So most of these deals we're seeing, Dan, has retained salary to it. Uh, speaking of which, any guesses how much money the Mets have retained right now in 2023? It's by far the most, as you might imagine. I don't even want to speculate. <laughs> okay, I'm going to put it this way. I'm going to quickly put it this way. The Mets have more retained money than eight total payrolls in Major League Baseball. Okay. Eight. The Mets have $98.2 million being paid to players who are not playing for them anymore, including, by the way, $20.25 million to Robinson Cano. In case you forgot that name. Um, It's been a weird three years, right? And, you know, this is the culmination of new owner, tons of money, trying to get his name out there overselling, overbuying everything, right? I mean, this is, they tried to build a contending team with veterans six months ago, literally six months ago. And almost immediately now, August 1st, it's now about building through the youth. And they're going to put seven prospect players out there, seven 25, you know, and under players out there, probably opening day next April. It's complete. They're completely changing 
their approach in less than a calendar year after spending five hundred million dollars in free agency last year. That that's what that's what has happened. That's how big this mistake is. And, and uh, again, I mean, Steve Steve Cohen has the money. We don't need to worry about that. But I mean, again, good on them for doing this because we're yep. seeing. We're seeing the flip side of this play out in in L.A. with the Angels, right? Instead, like what many view as a sinking ship, instead of taking your prospect capital and then throwing it at the problem, trying to get some, you know, pieces to plug the holes, the Mets are just saying, this didn't work. We're going to pull the plug. We're going to get younger. And they didn't take Mark Vientos and flip him for, uh, you know, a a bullpen arm or something like that. They looked themselves in the mirror and said, this isn't working. We're going to, we're going to adjust on the fly. Whereas the angels, I feel like they're just like, as they're, you know, falling down the well, they're just like, you know, clawing at the sides, trying to get back up and throwing, you know, potential future pieces at a problem, which is not, you know, is probably not the way to operate. So. No, I, I'll, I'll agree with you on that. I, I think admitting that you made the mistake is step one, uh, something the Padres are not doing. Uh, well, let's finish there. There's about, there's, you know, 30, 30 hours left in this trade deadline. Are the Padres going to realize what, what the heck they need to do here? Or are they going to hold for it? I'm not, I, I, they're one of the more puzzling teams. Um, okay. Yeah. I think they have to at least look, I mean, they're, they're out of it in my opinion. Right. So yeah, I think out. they have to try and get something for Josh Hader. They're like now that Jordan Hicks came off the board, he's, yeah probably the best back end arm um available i, I still I think am a little bit on the soto thing but no, I, I think snell goes yeah i think snell and hater are the two that you have to really look at and and, and maybe they can build you know kind of build it yeah. on the fly again here too so yeah similar two, situations two things real quick i just wanted to bring back on the mm. scherzer thing two points i i thought were interesting just to note since we're uh you know a money website he it's projected he's going to save about three million dollars in taxes on his move mm-hmm. from New York City to Texas. I thought that was a little bit interesting. Um, yep. Not that he wanted to get out of New York, but we saw the Degrom thing where he kind of mentioned the taxes and lifestyle, et cetera, um, moving from you know New York to Texas. Also, I don't know if you saw this. Max Scherzer is the first athlete in sports history to be paid. Fifteen million dollars by three different teams in the same year. Um, it's, it, it's kind of, it's not true. Okay, I, because, I, because Texas isn't paying him this year, at all. That so, makes sense. So that that's a bit of a farce. Now I, I haven't confirmed that it's possible that Texas is paying him like the league minimum the rest of the way just to cover their you know some of that. Um, but I'm pretty positive the Mets are paying all of his salary in 2023. All for got it. I, I, I think I interpreted this as for next year, 2024, with the deferred money from Washington. Money. That is correct. That is correct. So I think that's where I read it, but I'm sorry if that's fake. No, exactly. you, that it's is fake. correct. If you were referring to next year, I believe that is 100% correct because the Nats have like six more years of $15 million deferred payments. <laughs> yeah. 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 He's, yeah. he's, uh, he signed some charity contracts. There's no question about it. For um, sure. Tough, tough, uh, tough week for the Mets here. I don't think they're done, by the way. I think there's maybe one or two more names falling off this roster. And oh, by the way, we've talked about this before. Pete Alonzo getting a little antsy, Dan. Took, took a couple of interviews, was asked about where things are going and basically said, look, I, uh, I need to sit down with the front office myself and find out where this organization's headed because he's on a, a one-year plan here. One more year of arbitration for Pete Alonzo. Where do we go from there, Dan? In other words, I'm not ready to sign any kind of contract right now because <laughs> it looks like we're uh, we're going backwards, not forwards. So, I, I mean, which is expected and fair, but we were waiting for him to kind of chime in on this all, and it's exactly what you think it might be. So it could be a serious whole, wholesale change coming to the and $350 million Mets. This is way more long shot, but did you hear the Lindor comments too? It sounded just exactly the same as Pete Alonso, and you yeah. have to wonder – I'm not saying this is even on the table because he's like a leader type player. Is there a, is there a point where they look at that contract and say, well, we might hold, we might, we might eat a bunch of money on this and be willing to deal and just do a full, full rebuild. But I guess I say that with the point that if you're going to really rebuild and go full on youth, which it seems like they're going to go that route, 
is paying that much, you know, 30 plus to a short, uh, an aging shortstop to play. I, when you have Ronnie Mauricio or a bunch of, you know, other potential guys that could fill in there in a couple years, I, I don't think that's this year. I just think the Lindor comments and he said the same thing. I really need, like, I, I understand the moves, but it, it, it just had this ominous, ominous feel to it. Him and him and Pete both. I was kind of like, I, I don't, I mean, that's not a name being talked about, but mm. you'd have to think it's if they were willing note. to. Sour note to end on here, Dan. Yeah. So, I don't know. To answer your point, I don't know what the Alonzo thing looks like, but yeah, I could see that uh, being a big talking point coming into this off season. Does Nolan Arenado go today? Man, I don't know. I that was a name that surprised me a little bit. I know you thought um, the Dodgers are feisty right now, man. They are. Yeah, feisty. they don't mess around. They're back in first place and they want to roll. They want to go. So I, I think it's fifty fifty. I really do. All right, we'll recap this thing in a couple of days. Thanks, man. All right, thanks, Mike.